you for uh, the presentation and thank you for inviting me uh, to give this seminar. So uh, today I, I want to talk about some work that I have been doing uh, about one question that I find very interesting in machine learning, which is the uh, why actually, I mean, about the benefit of overparameterizing in supervised, uh, in supervised learning. So I'm going to talk about different works done in collaboration with different people. Uh, so in particular with uh, Stefan Dascoli and Maria Refinetti, who are PhD students at the Ecole Normale, and Florence Zacala, who is uh, at the Ecole Normale, at least for some months. Uh, and then he moved to PFL, and then with the group of Mathieu Viar at the PFL. So Mario Geiger is a PhD student there, and Stefano Spiegel is postdoc. And then work also done in collaboration with Levin Sagun, uh, who is at Facebook uh, AI in Paris. All right, so, uh, well, let me tell you what, I mean, the questions and my talk is about. So, oops. So it's about actually, uh, I mean, a general question in the problem of supervised learning by artificial neural network. I'm sure I don't have to give a large introduction on this. So just uh, two slides. So one is just to tell you that, or to remind you that um, in recent years, it became clear that artificial neural network, in particular, deep neural network, uh, have astonishing uh, success in classification problem, in particular of images. So here is an example of, uh, uh, so of a, uh, the CIFAR 10 data set in which you have 10 cl different classes of images. You train a neural network uh, on this uh, training set, and then you want the neural network to give an uh, uh, answer on, on images that uh, uh, the network had never seen before. And you want that, uh, and what, what comes out is that these deep neural networks are able to recognize new data to give precise answer with the highest precision ever achieved. Now, uh, the questions that it's very interesting to me, I mean, there are several questions which I think are very interesting and they're, let's say, are, uh, are topic of studies for uh, people that come from different background, in particular, I'm a physicist and I use statistical physics idea. So being a physicist, I think the first thing that you think about is what are the order of magnitude of the data and, and, and the problem. And so what you see is that just roughly speaking, if you think that the image is a vector of a few thousand of components, so it's a high dimensional object. And then if you think at the number of data that you have, that you use to train at this, this neural network, it can be something like uh, uh, a few hundred of thousands of images. So this is the number of, of examples that you use. Now, the thing which is very surprising is that the number of parameters that you tune uh, that uh, in order to uh, deep neural network to function are much, much bigger, uh, at least bigger than the number of data that you use. So for example, it can be of something of order 10 to the eight parameters. So I mean the number, so using much more parameters than, than data is something that in principle is surprising. So we, I think we are all used, uh, whatever is our background that in general, if you want to uh, fit, you do a fit, you don't use too many parameters, otherwise you would have overfitting. And somehow uh, the problem of supervised learning with artificial neural network is nothing else than uh, fitting in very high dimension. Now, the figure that I am showing here is something that, again, I find interesting uh, because here it's, it's a plot from, from Google Brain from 2018. And what they are doing is they're uh, comparing the accuracy of different uh, architecture of different neural network on a given uh, uh, data set, I think it was ImageNet. And what you see is that, well, actually this, I mean, when you move along this way, what changes is the number of parameters that are used and also the architecture. And actually, actually this also, this, uh, it's, uh, this different architecture uh, appear along the year. So the most important thing that I find really striking is that you see that now the, the problem is fixed and for a fixed problem, which means for a fixed number of uh, data in the training set, you see that the more parameter you use, the better becomes the accuracy. Of course, the architecture change also, but if you increase the number of parameter that you, that you have to tune, and this is not actually harmful uh, for the uh, generalization uh, ability. Actually, it's quite the contrary. The more parameter you use, the, sim the, more, the better seems to be the accuracy. So this is the question really that I would like to address that I find uh, interesting which is why actually overparameterizing is not harmful in, uh, in deep neural network doing supervised learning, 
and actually it's good, it seems to be good. So can we understand this problem? And I would like to first rephrase this problem in, let's say, in a very sketchy, car cartoonish way, and then try to be more precise to, uh, uh, to uh, try to state what the problem is really. So let me just first, in a cartoonish way, say what the problem is. So if you, well, if you very vaguely, so here you see I have two axes, I have nothing on the axis. Let's say on the y axis, I say the error, I'm not saying it's the test error or the accuracy. On the x axis, I have the number of parameters divided by the number of data. So you could think that you could imagine that when you increase the number of parameter uh, uh, divided by the number of data, if you use too many parameters compared to the number of data, especially, I mean, if you, if you, do, if you think to fit in low dimension, in principle, you would expect that the error should increase. So this is one possible option. There's another possible option that can happen is that if you increase the number of parameters divided by the number of data, well, the error increase, but it's not going to uh, shoot up, actually it's going to a certain asymptotic value, but still uh, over parameterizing is detrimental. So if you increase the number of parameters, then the error goes up. Then there is another option, let's say third option, which is, well, if you increase the number of parameter, then uh, for many, many parameters, uh, much more parameters than data, you go to a certain asymptote. And, uh, and actually, the more parameter you use, the lower is the, uh, is the error. So over parameterizing is beneficial. And then let's say there is a fourth option, which is not only the asymptotic value, there is an asymptotic value, and this is a decreasing function, but actually the asymptotic value that you reach is very small. And this seems to be actually the case, and again, this is just a cartoonish representation, but seems to be the case for a realistic deep neural network with realistic data. So using a lot of parameter is good, and is good first because when you over parameterize, the error goes down, and second, because the, the error that you achieve is very small. All right, so, this, uh, so what I want to address today is not be why the error is small, which I think is a totally different and much more difficult questions, but is uh, why actually when you increase the number of parameter, the error goes down. So why over parameterizing is beneficial? All right, so let me now try to uh, state the problem uh, a bit more seriously and also try to explain why this is, at least at, fir at first sight, uh, it's paradoxical. So, well, again, whatever is your background, whether it's physics, math, computer science, or statistics, I mean, just naively, you know that if you have a problem which is fitting and fitting in low dimension, uh, well, if you plot the error as a function of number of parameters divided by the number of data, if you use too many, too <coughs> a number of parameters which is too small, well, your model is not good. And so, well, typically you don't fit well because, well, you're not able to really characterize let's say the ground rule or the function that you want to fit. Instead, if you use uh, actually too many parameters, then you have, I mean, your model is too rich. And so what is going to happen is that you're going to fit perfectly uh, the uh, train set. But then if you change, if you take another set of, uh, set of data, then actually, while well, the, uh, the function that you have optimized, then it's not going to work for the new train set, for the new set, because, well, it just fit very precisely uh, the, the first training set. So it's not able to generalize well. So in general, what, you, well, what we learn really in undergraduate studies or even before at high school is that what you have to do, you have to do in a sweet spot in which the number of data is not too large and it's not too small. So in, okay, this is the set very, very, very naively. Then you can do something which is more concrete, which is done in statistical learning theory in which, oops. Okay, let me see. Okay, there's a problem with my, uh, with my slide. So let me maybe go back to the... Uh... Ouch. Mm, okay, there are all, there are questions missing. So can I just uh, uh, do it from the keynote? or recent, it's okay? Sure, yeah, yeah, you can use the keynote. I'm sorry, I have to. Mm. Yeah, what? Let me reconnect.
This meeting is being recorded. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Oops. I'm sorry for the. No worries. We had the worst things already in the seminar. So in the meantime, while we wait, maybe Rohit uh, from the speaker had an interesting question. Do you want to um, ask it in person to look at this while we wait? So you're asking about the, 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 the difference between population and training loss. Do you want to, oh wait, do you want to unmute yourself? I think we should unmute him, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Now you should be able to unmute. Oh, I don't know. Wait. Wait, I, I don't think I'm audible yet. I know. Now we hear you. Can you speak louder? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so the question is really about um, when we say that the error decreases on the population, then we're really sampling um, similar images, right? So if, if you talk about ImageNet or something, so it, it's difficult to say that overfitting does not actually right. still so cause harm. Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. We hear you. We hear, we hear you. Do you know, Rohit was asking this question. Maybe a moment, Rohit, to see if is everything okay, Julio, with you? Uh, sorry, just just one thing because I change from uh, one computer to the other to avoid the problem. So let me the screen, and then, uh, and then now, Ilya, you, you need to make a Julio co-host again because I, I think he he's yeah. not. Let me see. What I done. Uh, yes. So now Julio, you can share your screen. Okay. Perfect. This is so now I, I'm here on the keynote, so it should work hopefully. Let's see. If this is fine. Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe before you jumping back, maybe Rohit was asking a question. If uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah. So Rohit, can you ask maybe, or you want to un can you unmute yourself first of all again? Or, okay. Let me try again. Yes, Rohit. Now you should be able to talk, right? Is this audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go for yeah. So uh, the question was relating to um, which error is being discussed is decreasing, and whether or not we can we can make uh, statements about the population, say with images, if we talk about the population of all images when we train and test with, um, say, classification problems of image types. Does that make it more clear, or maybe it's better uh, in the chat? So so, so I'm not really discussing about the, the population. I'm really discussing, uh, so I mean, it's, uh, in general, I'm, I'm discussing the test error. It's true that uh, what I'm saying uh, in principle, I would like to say for the test error uh, and also for the accuracy in the prediction. Okay. So, but then uh, you're still constrained by the data set then? Like, uh, yes. is the test so, error on that data set? Yeah, so, well, I have, the, I have a train uh, uh, data set and a test data set, which are not the same. Uh, yes, but it's true. I mean, I'm fixing the data set. That's the idea. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, all right. So, let me, so what the thing that I wanted to, uh, to say is that, uh, so now, I mean, if I'm trying to be a little bit more uh, theoretical, so if I have a problem, so in the statistical learning theory, there is a way actually to, to describe this curve, uh, this U curve, and the way is the following. So imagine that you have a function f out of x that you want to describe, and what you get, uh, we don't have this function, but what you have, you have a training uh, data set, which means a collection of x and y, 
which are produced by the law y equal to f out of x plus epsilon, and epsilon is, uh, is some noise. And what you want to do is that you want to describe this uh, input-output relation with a certain model, which is given by the function f of x of wd. And wd, w are parameters that you have to fix, uh, well, that you have to fit, actually. Now, while well, I wrote down the, the error, which here is just a mean square error between the uh, the, uh, the output, which is f out of x plus epsilon, minus the model that we use. And wd are the parameters that uh, have been fixed, uh, that have been optimized, minimizing uh, the, uh, the mean square loss on the training set. Now, the idea is that you can always write this error. First, you decompose. So you, you decompose in a part which is just the uh, square difference between f out of x, which is the function, let's say the ground through, and, and minus the uh, function f. And then you have some noise, which is, just, which is just some part of the noise, which is unavoidable, which is the noise that you get uh, uh, when you use the, uh, the test, error, the, the, uh, test uh, data set. So now the idea behind this uh, bias variance trade-off is to rewrite this f out of x minus f in two terms. So there is one part, you just do a small telescope in which you take f out of x, you subtract the average over uh, the training set of, uh, of your model because w, d, w, the parameters depend on the training set. So you take the average of this over, uh, over, the, uh, over the data, of the set of data that you have. So you assume that you have a probabilistic uh, uh, distribution for the data. And then just, uh, well, you subtract and you add it again. So when you do this, you replace in the square and then you do a little bit uh, uh, of, of algebra, you see that you can rewrite the error in two terms. There's one term which is called the bias square, which is the difference between the ground through the function f out of x minus the average over uh, the training set of your model, fx of wd. And then there is another term which is instead is called the variance, which is the fluctuation of uh, the function f, so your, your model, minus, I mean, it's average over the training set. And so you can always think that the error is decomposed in these two terms. One is the bias square and the other is the variance. This is a way to rephrase what I said before in a more uh, theoretical way. So if the number of parameters is small, well, the model is very poor. So the bias is very big in the sense because, well, you are biasing a lot your, your model. And uh, so in principle, you will have a big error because while well, you have a big bias, the model is, is, very, is very poor. It's very different. So the f out of x will be very different from the average over the training set of your model. And instead, if the number of parameters is very large, what you get is that while well, the fluctuation uh, due to, uh, the training, uh, to the training set will be very large. So the fluctuation in your model will be very large and this will cause a big error. And so while well, this is why actually, while well, this, this characteristic U curve, uh, which tells you that you have to find a trade-off between bias and variance to find a, a, a sweet spot in the number of parameters divided by the number of data. Okay, so this is well, very standard theory. Now, there is a bit, little bit that can be added, which was added actually by physicists uh, in this kind of problem, which physicists that have been studying neural network, I would say few nodes neural networks, let's say the perceptron, for example, just one node neural network, what they found is that they found curves which were similar to this, but they find something else. They also find that uh, actually when the number of parameters is divided by the number of data is such that you reach zero uh, training loss or zero training error. So meaning that if the number of parameter is too small, then you will have a, 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 a training error which is different from zero. But if you increase the number of parameter at a certain point, while well, you will be able to reach a zero uh, training error. So at this point, actually, the, uh, there is a peak of the error, which is due to the fact that when you are very close, when you are very close to zero uh, training error, you are going to amplify a lot the noise. And so this produces a peak. And so I would say that this description with the, let's say the U curve and, and the peak when, uh, when the number of parameters by the number of data is such that you get zero training error is what was known I mean, from standard theory and from standard theory, I would say, I mean, the uh, statistical learning theory and statistical physics result that come from, let's say, uh, the 90s, uh, more or less. So this is, let's say, what happens in, uh, you, you can think is, well, again, what happens in, uh, in, slow di in low dimension or if for a few nodes, a neural network. Now, what, what happens in reality, I mean, if you try to do experimental, numerical experiments on, uh, 
it's a real data with uh, realistic or semi-realistic neural network, artificial neural networks, is different. And so here I'm an empirical experiment that we did, but actually several people uh, did it, uh, obtain very similar results. So here, what you have here is that, so below I describe uh, the kind of neural, artificial neural network that we consider. So this was done uh, together with, with the group of Mathieu VR at EPFL. So we consider a fully connected neural network with, for example, five layers. We consider hinge loss, the kind of initialization, no regularization, and we train the system on, on means, actually on parity means. And what you have here is the result. So in the blue, just look at the blue line. So the blue line is the, uh, uh, is the error, the, um, uh, the error in the prediction. When you, when you increase the number of parameters. Now, the vertical line, which correspond to P star, is where the training error goes to zero. So on the left of this, of P star, the training error is different from zero. On the right, which I call the overparameterized re regime, the, uh, the training error is zero. So what you see is that the blue line is not at all like the line, the, the line that I showed you before. It doesn't have a U curve, it has a peak, but actually what it shows is that when the number of parameters increase, the error goes down. And well, let me tell you how we increase the number of parameters. The way in which we increase the number of parameters is just that we increase the width of uh, this five layer, five layer uh, neural network. So while the behavior is different and while what I would like to, well, first, as I told you, uh, we are not the first uh, to, uh, to see uh, that increasing the number of parameter, this test error goes down. So you don't see the U curve. The first numerical experiment that I know of, but maybe it's not the first, but I mean, at least the first that I know of is the, the one by Natis Rebro and, and collaborators. But then there have been many works and also works uh, that have shown that on realistic neural networks, so much more complicated than just a five layer fully connected networks than with much more uh, complex data, you find this kind of behavior. So what and this kind of behavior actually, which is not the U curve, has been uh, called or dubbed by Belkin et al. double descent. Because what well, looks like that this is the error is going down, so it's descending and then there's a peak and then descends again. So this is, well, the behavior that I would like to describe and try to uh, uh, rationalize today. So my idea today is try to give a theoretical understanding on why this blue curve behaved like this. So why there is a peak and why then uh, the test error goes down when they increase the number of parameters. And also while the existence of the peak, you could think, you could imagine that is related to the peak actually that I was discussing before that was uh, found in, uh, let's say, few nodes neural network long time ago. But as I will tell you at the end, I mean, the situation is more complex. This is not quite the same peak actually that was discussed at that time. All right, so that's the idea. This is the thing that I want to explain. And the way to explain it, the idea is to try well, again, like a physicist, I will try to find some simple model uh, that allow you, allow me to, uh, to, uh, to understand uh, this behavior. Of course, the simple model, which are actually random features model, are, I mean, are very uh, simple, um, let's say characterization, but simple representation of, uh, of a neural network, but they are simple enough to be analyzed. Then I will try to discuss also what is called the neural tangent kernel limit, this is interesting because it's related to the behavior in the, really in the asymptotic limit of very large number of parameters. And then I will also use numerical experiments to check whether our scenario is on the, on, the, on, the, on the right track or not. And then of course I will discuss all the things that I left over that would be interesting to, uh, to address. Okay, so that's the idea. So let me start first with a simple model, which I think actually maybe Andrea Montanari who uh, spoke at this uh, seminar already discussed. Uh, so the model is the following. Uh, so it's a random featured model, but I will interpret in a, in a slightly different way. So what we're doing is that we are considering a one hidden layer neural network and uh, we don't train. So we take uh, an initial condition, which is the say Lekan initialization, meaning that we, we just take a, a Gaussian uh, run independent random weight for the initial condition. But then what we do is that we train just uh, the second layer weight. So what they, I call A. Um, and then, uh, so it's important for us. So, well, because of the, you can think 
to this model in two ways. A, there is a random features model. So the, uh, the blue dot are, are, the, are the random features. Or you can really think, and this is the interpretation that I want to use because it's useful for uh, what I want to do, is you, you can think that is a very cartoonish representation of an artificial neural network in which I'm just training uh, the, uh, the second layer. So, well, to be more precise, so the function uh, that the way in which we describe the function f of x is, uh, well, is, the, uh, is just the sum over ai and then some activation sigma. Uh, so the ai are the parameter that I'm going to uh, train and I'm going to train them uh, using a mean square loss with, uh, with, with, uh, with a, uh, an infinitesimal regularization. So the data that we are considering, the run the model that we are we want to fit, is a linear model. But actually, we can do also a more general model like a random Gaussian function. But I mean, for for the purpose of this discussion, there is I mean we can stick to the uh, uh, to the linear model. And then what I'm going to study, I'm going to study the limit, and this is where the model can be solved, in which the number of parameters the number of training uh, data and the dimension of the data all go to infinity at fixed ratio. So P over N and N over D are fixed. And in this limit, the model can be solved using uh, techniques that come from random matrix theory uh, and also the replica method that, which come from statistical physics. So again, this is a model which has been as a random feature model has been introduced uh, in 2008 and has been discussed very recently uh, by Andrea Montanari and Song Mei, precisely to try to describe this double descent. So what they shown, which is very interesting, is that if you look at the test error as a function of the number of parameter divided by the number of data, you find precisely this double descent that I was showing you in, in the numerical experiment. So the test error increase, then uh, it, it, it has a peak actually can be a true divergence in this model uh, for a value of p over n, which is equal to one, which is where you get zero training error in this model. And then it goes down again. Uh, so this is just an experiment. So here, so while the black line is their exact analytical results, and then the, the dots are actually the results from numerical simulation. So you see that even though we are uh, working in the, let's say, asymptotic limit of large D, large N, and large P, actually, if you take D equal to 100, uh, the uh, results, the analytical results match very, very, uh, in a very good way, the numerical results. So this is, I think it's the very important result by May Montanari that tells you that in this model, clearly there is the double descent that we would like to understand. So that's, that's good news. And so now what I would like to do now is try to understand why there is this double descent, why actually when you increase the number of parameters, the test error goes down from the point of view of uh, bias and variance that I discussed at the beginning. So what we're going to do is we're going again to uh, do this bias and variance decomposition. But I think there is a very important new ingredient that was been discussed, has been discussed in the paper, a modern take on bias variance trade-off in neural network, which I think is very important in the case of modern neural network is that when you are in the uh, over-parameterized regime, there is a, a new source of fluctuation that you don't have when you discuss uh, the stand, in the standard way the bias variance trade-off. And the, the new uh, source of fluctuation is the optimization procedure. What I mean by this is that when you train a neural network, you start from a certain initial condition and you train it with a certain optimization scheme. But once, when you are in the over-parameterized regime, in principle, there are many, many different solutions. There is not just one solution. So the solution that you find depend on the initial condition and depend on the way in which you have optimized, you have done the dynamics, the training dynamics. So this is a, another source of fluctuation, which is not due uh, to the sampling or the noise in the training levels. So it's, which is not considered in the standard uh, bias variance trade-off, which I will argue is actually the most important source of fluctuation, so most important source of variance uh, in, in, in modern setting. So the way is very similar. So we proceed in a very similar way. So we decompose the variance in a part which is due to the noise in the training labels and a part, a part which is due to the sampling. So the, uh, the fact that you don't see, I mean, uh, you have a fluctuation due to the fact that you see different X, different uh, uh, data, uh, depending on the training set that you're using. But then 
uh, we, I want also to consider the variance due to optimization scheme. So in the simplest, simple model that we are considering, again, remember what I told you is that the model, in the model we are considering, we take a one hidden uh, layer, uh, and then we optimize only the uh, second layer weights. So this means that the layer in the first weight, which are the initial condition, in general, I mean, they are optimized. In our case, they are not optimized, but they give uh, the source of variance, which is related to optimization. So depending on the weight of the initial layer, actually, we will get a different solution. And so while well, it's the variance be, uh, because of this, the fluctuation due to the initial layer, which will be the variance due to the optimization in this simple model. So now we have all the different sorts of variances. We have the bias. And so what we did is that we compute in this model all these different sorts of bias and variance. And so here is the result. So let's see, I mean, there are many curves. So again, if you have questions, ask me. But uh, so we'll go through them. So we have the black curve, which is the generalization error. So here is a kind of zoom around uh, the peak, uh, which is the peak, which is called the interpolation threshold or jamming in the uh, physics jargon. And so what I want to describe, remember, I want to describe why there is this peak and why when you go on number of parameter, which is above this peak, uh, the uh, error is going down. Why over parameterizing is good. And so if you, I decompose all the, I see all the, all the different source of error, you see that you have the, let's say the yellow line which is the sampling variance, which is increasing as expected uh, from the standard theory. And then actually the after an interpretation threshold remains constant. You have the bias which increase, which decrease and then stay constant after the interpretation threshold. So this also is expected. And instead what you see is that you have that the, uh, um, what is called the initialization variance, which will be the optimization variance in a more general setting has a peak at the interpolation threshold, and then it goes down when for p large. And actually, also the uh, uh, the blue line, which is the initial in, sorry, the blue line is the initialization variance, and the green line is the noise variance behaving in a similar way. So while the way something that uh, it's important, so from this you would uh, conclude that the overfitting, so the re, the origin of the peak, and also why actually when you overparameterize the error goes down is due to the behavior of the uh, randomness in the label, so the noise variance and the initialization variance. Actually, the way in which we did the computation is such that, you know, when you do the bias variance, uh, when you decompose the variance, first you decompose the variance, uh, the part which depends on the noise, then the parts which depends on the uh, optimization, and then at the end, the parts which, uh, uh, which depend on, on the sampling. And so, well, what I want to argue is that the way in which we did the computation actually is such that the, uh, uh, we have still a peak, uh, a green peak, which corresponds to the noise variance, but because actually within this noise variance, there is a part which is also related to the optimization. So just to clarify this point, what I'm going to do in the following, uh, I'm going to consider ensembling. So ensembling is the following idea. So what I, which is shown in the uh, left part of the slide. So what I do is that I take uh, some data X and then I take one neural network, which uh, has some, uh, let's say first uh, layer weight. Then I take a, a second neural network in which I have a, another set of second la uh, first layer weight and then another one. And then my uh, output function will be the average of this. So I'm just doing an ensembling. So in a more general context, what I do is just, I take different initial condition and I average uh, my output function will be the average over uh, a certain number k of, of neural network with different initial condition. So if, and what I want to know, I, I want to understand what happens to the test error when I'm doing this average, which is just an average of the neural network uh, over the initial condition. And this is what you see on the right. So on the right, you have the continuous line are uh, the, uh, the, uh, the simulation for different value of k. And then uh, the points again are simulation, which show you that the exact analysis again that is done in the high dimensional limit is actually uh, quite robust, even if you take uh, D, which is not infinite. And so what you see from there is that the more you average, the more you average over initial condition, the more first the peak disappear, and the more actually, as soon as you are above the interpolation threshold, so as soon as you are 
above the number of parameter at which you reach zero training loss, you reach instantaneously the value that you would reach for infinite value of P if you consider just one neural network. So what this is telling you is that actually, well, the very large amount of fluctuation that cause a very big variance is just due to the fluctuation in the initial condition. Because if you average over initial condition, you just wash out all this fluctuation and the test error is exactly the one that you get for the infinite value of P. So while this, uh, and what is, this is also telling you is that the effect of over parameterize, what is doing actually, in a certain sense, you can think that it's just repeating. I mean, it's more subtle than this, but if you take a very, very large neural network, then you can think that in a certain sense, it's like repeating some pieces of, of a neural network with different initialization. And so taking a very large uh, network is a little bit like ensembling. Quantitatively, it's not like this. Ensembling is better, but actually, if you take in the, in the, the, the larger is the network, the more you uh, uh, average out the fluctuation due to the initial condition, which are the main cause actually of the variance, and so the main cause of the error in the overparameterized regime. So this is, well, I would say the result of uh, analyzing this, the model of uh, random features that I described. And now, while well, this is just a model, so let's see what you see if you do a numerical experiment. So the first thing is, again, I'm going back to this paper that I like a lot, a modern take on a bias variance trade-off. And here they compute, they had this idea indeed, the first to have this idea to decompose the variance in a part which is due to the optimization and the part which is due to the sampling, which is the usual one. And what you see here is that if you look at the variance, the total variance, which is the blue line, so it has a peak and then it goes down when the, uh, you increase the number of parameters. So this was a numerical experiment, I think on C510. Uh, and, uh, and what you see is that going, the going down of the variance uh, the, the global variance, when you increase the number of uh, parameter, is due to the behavior of the variance due to optimization. So here is, well, I think it's a really it's a numerical experiment that really illustrates what I was saying before. It's the variance due to the optimization that is playing the main role in the behavior of the variance and then, and, and hence, of the test error. Then another example, let me go back to the uh, initial curve that I show you. Uh, so this was the blue line, the test error as a function of number of parameter, which was the, uh, uh, the numerical experiment that we did. And now, if you look at the, uh, so forget about the green line, we can discuss it later if you're interested, but look at the yellow line or the orange line. So the uh, orange line is what you get if you un do ensembling over 20, uh, 20, uh, 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 20 copies of the uh, neural network. So what you see here is that you have precisely what I show you in the, in the case of the random features or almost precisely what I show you in the case of random feature is that if you average over already 20 uh, neural network, actually you decrease, I mean, all the test error goes down and you reach actually a value just after the interpolation threshold, which is practically the same of the one that you reach if P is very large. So this again is telling you that it's because of the initial condition, actually, is the, uh, the fluctuation in the initial condition that you have, uh, I mean, it's the variance due to the, initial, to the uh, initial condition, which plays the main role in giving you a high variance and giving you a test error. So one way to, a way, an effective way to reduce it is to take in P very large, so the number of parameters very large. In this way, you have a kind of uh, self-averaging of the system uh, in the sense that you are, in a certain sense, testing many different artificial neural network at the same time. Okay, so this is the, uh, um, so the, the, the comparison with, with numerical experiments. But actually, again, I mean, from the point of view of theory, I try to show you a way to understand this behavior just using a model, which is random features, which is a very special model. Uh, but I mean, I think the advantage of the model is that allow you to describe the entire curve. So we have really a peak and then, and then, and then a decrease after the peak. So it describes completely the double descent, and then you can understand where the double descent come from in terms of bias and variance. To try to be a bit more general, we can ask, okay, now if we consider a, a more general, so the neural network that we consider, so this uh, fully connected network, can we understand the limit when P go to infinity? Can we understand the behavior when P go to infinity? So when P go to infinity, we have in a certain asymptotic behavior 
here of the test error, can we understand that this for fully connected network, why you approach this asymptotic behavior from above, which in a way is saying why overparameterization is beneficial at least when P is very, very large. Now this can be done uh, in general and uh, can be done using a uh, very recent result or uh, on scaling limit of or mean feed limit or scaling limit of a uh, neural network. So the large P limit of neural network has been studied with uh, what I call Lekan uh, initialization, which means the uh, which means a particular initialization of the weight, the scale of the weights uh, that I can discuss more if you're interested. So the important thing here is that when P go to infinity, so our model, so our fully connected system, so when the width actually go to infinity, uh, can be described exactly and becomes equivalent to a kernel model, which is the neural tangent kernel. Uh, has been discussed by Jaco, Gabriel, and Ungler in 2018. So the idea is that, well, I wrote the equation for the evolution of the uh, output function, so the output function of the artificial neural network, f hat of p, uh, which is a function of the input and is a function of time. So this is what, uh, how, this, how the function evolved during training in general. So this equation that I wrote is, is general uh, for a general neural network and the kernel k in principle evolve change with time. Now when p go to infinity the big simplification of the neural tangent kernel is that first k reach a limit has a limit when p go to infinity and second actually it does not evolve. So the value that you have to put in this equation is just the value of the kernel at equals zero. And uh, so this actually means that the system is, I mean, the artificial neural network works like, uh, like, like, like a kernel method. And now, so this means that actually the asymptotic value that I was showing here, so the asymptotic value where P going to infinity, at least with the initial kind of uh, initialization that we consider, uh, is, is, is understood and correspond to a kernel limit, which is the neural tangent kernel. So now the question is why you reach the uh, asymptotic test error, which corresponds to the test error for the neural tangent kernel from above, which again, it's a way to say why overparameterization is beneficial, why it's good to increase P. Uh, well, and this can be understood if you study the correction to the uh, neural tangent kernel. So what you can ask is that, well, if you have a, a network which is very wide, but it's not really infinitely wide, what are the leading large P correction to the NTK? And this has been studied. So uh, we'll say we have, uh, uh, we have proposed arguments in this paper with Mathieu Viar and collaborator. And then there have been rigorous proof that have shown that if you look at the uh, most important correction at large P to the NTK, there are two kinds of correction. There is one correction, which is, well, the kernel, I told you when P go to infinity converge to something, but if converge to a certain kernel, when P is finite, of course, you expect fluctuation of this kernel. For example, the kernel at, at initialization will depend on the initial condition, so it will have some kind of fluctuation. And then the other correction is that, well, if P is not infinite, well, the kernel will evolve in time. So you cannot just take uh, the kernel at equal zero. And now what has been uh, shown is that uh, what can be, I mean, can be uh, found quite easily, uh, maybe proven it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, uh, is that, Actually, the leading correction are not the fact that the kernel evolves in time, but are the fact that the kernel fluctuates at initialization. This they goes like p to the uh, one uh, minus one fourth, instead the other goes like p to the minus one half. So the leading correction to the NTK limit is the fact that you have fluctuation at initialization of the kernel. And so while these are the leading fluctuation then also in the output function. And so while if you go just go through the math, then you can show that the, 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 the most important source of variance, which gives you the, I mean the, the, uh, the difference in error between the error of the NTK and the error when P is very large, but is not infinite, is due to the fluctuation of the kernel at the initialization, which is nothing else than the fluctuation due to the initial condition, which is again, is exactly, I mean, the same thing that I discussed before. So this is another way to, to say what I said before is that uh, for very large, at least for large P, what it seems is that if I take this different point of view, is that uh, there is a part of the variance which is, comes from the sampling, uh, which uh, maybe increase and go to an asymptotic value, 
but the largest component to the, to the variance is due to the uh, uh, optimization, to so the initial condition. This is something that you don't have in normal, uh, narrow, I mean, in low dimensional um, fitting problem, but that you do have in overparameterized neural network. Okay, so before concluding, actually, uh, I would like to go back to, uh, uh, well, to discuss something else, um, but briefly, is that all the things that I discuss about double descent, I discuss it changing the number of parameter divided by the number of data. But actually, at least in the, well, in principle, there are three control parameter or three parameter that matters. There is the number of parameter of the network, there is the, the dimension of the data, and the number of data that you use in the, in the training set. And so, and so it's interesting to try to understand how the test error change when you change this parameter. And so the uh, three figures that you see here is, uh, well, let's say the two figures, the central figure and the figure on the left, are analytical computation in this, always in the random features model, in which we can, again, as I told you, we take the d go to infinity, p go to infinity, and n go to infinity, but at fixed ratio. And so the, uh, uh, so I don't have the, uh, the cursor to show you, but when I, uh, uh, if I fix what I show you before is what happens when n over d is fixed. So the number of uh, data divided by the dimension of the data is fixed and I change the number of parameters. So this is the uh, dashed line that you see in the left figure. And so you see that you go through a double descent there. So a double descent, you go through a peak and then the test error goes down. But actually what you can do is also you can do something else. You can fix the number of parameters divided by the number of data and see what happens if you increase the number uh, of data that you used, which is n over d. And so in this case, you see that at least in the left figure, which is a case in which the signal to noise ratio is, is large. Uh, so you get again something which has a peak and then it goes down. But then actually, if you decrease the signal to noise, what you see is that you have something different. So again, if you go, if you increase the number of parameter at uh, fixing n over d, so the number of data divided by dimension, you have the usual double descent that I discussed before. But instead, if you fix the number of parameter divided by the dimension and you change the number of data, uh, then what you see, you have, you see that you have two peaks. Now, it's interesting, these two peaks are interesting because they ties in with the previous work that I discussed at the very beginning of physicists. So physicists, when they study, let's say the perceptron, which was, let's say one node, they had P over D that was fixed. So the number of parameter was exactly equal to the number of, of dimension. And so if you look at this figure, when P over D is equal to one, this is where the two, actually two peaks are merging. So the, peaks, the two peaks that you have when you increase N, this uh, triple descent. And then so, and, and instead in, in real, uh, in, in real system, in realist, more realistic system in which P over D is uh, typically larger, larger than one, the peak that you see is not really, well, it's, it's something else. And especially you can see one peak or two peaks depending if you change P or if you change N. Now, I would like to discuss, uh, just to complete discussing, what are these two peaks? What is the physics related to these two peaks? Now, in order to understand this, to what is the physics related to these two peaks, what you can do is that you can do the, you can change the activation. Again, we can do it. I mean, the computation in the random features model is nice because you can also change the kind of activation that you use. And then you can also check, so this is what we have done uh, doing, using simple neural network that things remain correct, doing numerical experiments. So what you have in the, in the figure, which is on the bottom left, is the behavior of the test loss when you change N over D. So now is where, is the case in which you have this triple descent. And you have different curves, and these different curves correspond to the yellow one to a complete linear activation. And then, and then you change, you have tanch, you have relu, and you have absolute value. So different kind of nonlinearities. And what you see is that when you have the linear activation, you don't have triple descent. You just have a peak when n, is div n divided by d is equal to one. And instead, well, when you have different activation, you can have the two peaks and one can be higher than the other. So the reason of the two peaks is that, well, when you have a completely linear activation, well, you know that the effective number of parameter is not the parameter that you use, but it's just the number, um, sorry, it's just the dimension because, well, even if you put more layer, 
you're just, I mean, at the end, everything is, is equivalent to just a simple network with uh, D parameters. And so it's normal that in that case, the effective number of parameters is, is N. And so you should see in the linear case, just a peak whenever N over D is equal to one. And then while well, we know that if the, you have nonlinearities, we expect the peak when P over D uh, is equal to one. And then well, what you can think is that, well, when, when you have nonlinearities, but the nonlinearity is not too strong, I mean, in a certain sense that I can discuss more later, well, you will have a, a, rem, a remnant of, of the peak that you have in the linear case, then the test error will go down, then it will go up again uh, at the, uh, what is the true interpolation threshold. So this was just to show you that, I mean, it's, you have different double or triple descent depending if you change the number of parameter and the number or the number of, of uh, example, and especially the difference uh, with the old studies done, done by physicists. After all, the peak that they found somehow was merging two different peaks that have two different interpretation. Okay, so now I think I, it's a good time to uh, conclude. So what I wanted to discuss is to try to address this question, which I find very interesting in, in supervised learning by deep neural network, which is why if you use many parameters, much more parameter than data, this is not harmful and is actually good. And so I started showing you the uh, U-curve that uh, you have for uh, low dimensional fitting and how this U-curve is actually replaced by a double descent curve in, that you find in numerical experiment. And then what I uh, try to argue is that the origin of this double descent curve is well, there are two, well, the peak, you have a peak, and the reason of the peak is that uh, when you're very close to uh, the interpolation threshold, you are amplifying the overfitting of the noise. But the big question, which I think is very interesting, is why actually you, you go down, so why the test error goes down after the interpolation threshold. And the idea is that in the regime of overparameterization, you have, of course, the bias that it has going down, like in the normal theory, you have the variance due to sampling that is increasing, but it's going to a certain asymptote. And then actually what you have is that a new kind of variance, which is just due to the initial condition and to the optimization that you don't have in the standard theory. And this is playing the main role and uh, it's giving fluctuation in the output function and taking more parameters. So taking, for example, in our case, taking a wider neural network, what it does is that decrease this variance. And this, at least in this setting, is the reason why uh, actually this variance decrease and why it is, is beneficial to over parameterize the network. So this, while it's, uh, it's the point of view that I want to, uh, to push forward, there are other explanation. Uh, so like, uh, for example, the implicit regularization of the learning dynamics put forward by, by Zrebro. And if I have to say what is really missing in a sense in all this discussion that I've done, which is, I think is feature learning. So I didn't discuss at all feature learning, there are no features that are learned in the, uh, neither in the random features case, because you have just random features, nor in the NTK case. So I think it's, this is something that is missing and it would be nice to try to, uh, to also to understand and to study model in which there is also feature learning and to try to understand why over parameterization is not harmful and actually is beneficial uh, also in, in that context. So thank you very much for your attention.